So in this lecture now we turn to the actual implementation of these detection techniques in real missions. And in missions for cosmic ray detection, we have to deal with one very, very important boundary condition. That is, we cannot just build an experiment in the same way that, for example, a calorimeter or a general purpose detector for a collider at the LHC is being built. I give you an example, the Atlas detector um, as a Lego toy um, mock-up. This is um, a massive detector, which is uh, dimensions of 46 meters and 25 meters in a cylindrical um, setup uh, with a total mass of 7,000 tons is way beyond what you can bring into space. And they're actually even too big to show in a picture. That's why I put this, this picture of a Lego mock-up here, because pictures from the cavern where they actually located, they only show you some parts of the detector and you do not get an overview. Um, so for a cosmic ray detector that would operate above or at the edge of the atmosphere, you would rely on either a, a rocket, uh, which would bring this thing up in a low Earth orbit, for example, or a stratospheric balloon, which would lift it up to the um, upper part of the stratosphere at about 40 kilometers. And so you need to strike a compromise because these are limited in terms of the dimensions that a mission can have and its mass. So um, I show you a picture of the uh, Saturn uh, V rocket, uh, which was the one that brought people to the moon. And that one is still a record keeper in terms of its payload that it could bring up to low Earth orbit um, of 140 tons. This may be uh, getting a little bit better with the in the next decade when the Falcon Super Heavy will be actually starting to bring missions to space. But even that is metered at about 100 to 150 tons, so it will not bring it up by an order of magnitude or so. Stratospheric balloons, on the other hand, um, they are able to lift up to six tons up to the atmosphere, to the stratosphere. And in both cases, the size or the dimension of the instrument that you can fly is limited to something which is like two to three meters or so. Uh, you can make it a little bit bigger, but not very much. So you cannot go to 20 meters. And there's a, maybe a comment here I want to make. If you want to uh, think about your own mission, um, the DLR, so the German Aerospace um, Center, they do um, foster smaller projects to be flown on their um, small platforms, which is the Rexus. This is a, a rocket so, uh, rocket uh, launch site in, in Scandinavia. And Bexos, which is um, a platform for stratospheric balloons, which are also launched in northern Scandinavia. So you can apply for, for, uh, for this actually this year again. If you are interested, contact me. So um, let's talk about balloon, balloon missions, which have really been flown and are continuing to fly, which are used for charged cosmic ray detection. So I've put up here two um, examples. Uh, one is the, the CREAM um, balloon mission, and the other one is the ISOMAX. And they are really representative for these kind of missions. So um, they do look different, but intrinsically, if you look carefully, they do share lots of similarities. So let's look at the CREAM uh, mission for a moment. So the CREAM mission consists out of um, an upper part, which you see consists out of uh, two so-called TRDs. So these are so-called transition radiation detectors. We didn't discuss transition radiation detectors here at all. But um, you see already from the way that they are arranged, they are acting as almost like a tracking type detector because you see all these white circles. These are tubes which um, are uh, oriented in orthogonal way. So you, the, the second layer will have tubes running in the paper plane and the others are basically pointing the, the, in the direction of the paper. So, so these are um, acting in, in, in two different uh, purposes. They are basically of allowing to track the particle. And the transition radiation detector is also the nice feature um, that um, the way that radiation is produced here and these um, little gas tubes which are running through a, a polystyrene material is that you produce X-rays through something which is called transition radiation. And um, the transition radiation itself is um, uh, allowing you to measure the, the Lorentz factor of the particle. So this is a very simple way to measure the energy of a particle, or let's say the Lorentz factor of the particle. You still need to know the mass, um, but you, you do get two informations. You get the tracking information because it's a spatial resolved detector, and on the other hand, you get also by measuring the signal, you get also the information of the energy. And 
below this this uh, transition radiation detector you find um, a uh, sort of rudimentary calorimeter it's um, consisting out of layers of um, scintillators and um, also as a conversion material they're using tungsten so the bottom part is actually then the final um, electromagnetic calorimeter and you get to measure through these various layers of scintillation material you get to measure the um, energy losses and that's then used to turn into charge number z the scintillator on top that you see and the scintillator on the bottom they act as a time of flight measurement so you can determine then the measure you can measure the, t the, the beta and this is important to distinguish low um, energy particles which have high ionization losses uh, that you could mistake for, for example, for a, a, a particle which has a larger charge number. So you need the time of flight to determine the beta. And in the middle, there's a Trenkov counter, uh, which uh, uses Trenkov light um, in order to, um, uh, to to measure the momentum in a sense. So it's it's, it's acting as an additional detector component. So so this thing is very compact. You see, it's 120 times 120, so it's a block of a little bit more than a cubic meter. And given that all the components, except for the tungsten in the bottom, are really lightweight, it can fly on a balloon. And it can fly on a balloon for quite some time. That's the nice thing about balloon missions. Um, let me just zoom in maybe here on this figure a little bit. So this is showing uh, the Antarctic continent. And you see that the, 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 the track marks here is essentially what the balloon traces out over the course of roughly a month a time that it takes data. So it passes around the South Pole multiple times, two to three times is a common way, until it basically passes near to the McMurdo station. Then it basically, you, you, you cut the line and then the lower part uh, comes down with a parachute and can be recovered and used for, for another mission to come. And this is the way such a balloon mission is flown. Uh, you blow up this stratospheric balloon with helium and then it basically at some point carries off the, the, uh, the weight. And with this, uh, the gondola is supported down here on this on this on this supporting uh, crane. And once the balloon goes up, then you basically um, let it go, and basically it floats, it flies away. It is not with a, not easy. You have to wait for the right wind direction because otherwise the gondola can take uh, damage. And you see the gondola down here is mounted in a way that you have also solar panels to get the energy uh, that you need to power the system. Now on the right you see something which is the so-called Isomax balloon mission. It looks very similar. It has some differences. In this case, for example, you have magnetic, magnetic coils. So you can measure actually a little bit the, um, the curvature radius of this whole thing. And it's using, uh, for example, trank of the counters on the top and the bottom. Uh, it uses uh, drift chambers in order for spatial reconstruction. And it has a drift chamber here. So this whole thing is essentially like a gaseous detector mainly. So it's very, very lightweight. And it uses again time of flight uh, to measure the temperature, the, the time of flight to, to discern um, uh, where the, in the ionization loss curve we actually located. And as an example here, you can measure uh, the charge number with a high precision. And this is just showing you how well this can be measured. So it starts with helium, then it goes on to the more, uh, more heavy limits. You see the pronounced peak for carbon. And um, you can easily see that it's possible to discern the different particle species with the charge resolution available here. For the CREAM mission, I just want to show some result on the energy spectrum that was measured. So you see CREAM 1, CREAM 2, and CREAM 3. These are subsequent missions which were flown in uh, three seasons on, in the Antarctic. And you see that basically with the CREAM measurements, it's possible to, to trace out the energy spectrum from 10 GeV up to of the order of 100 TeV here. And you can also separate the various species. So, um, you know, there's uh, hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, and even iron. Note that they have been separated by multiplying them with a factor. So they are basically um, uh, separated so that you can see them. They are, would be otherwise partially overlapping. Um, for space-based mission, then you would take such a detector, bring it into near-Earth orbit, either as a free-flying satellite, and that's the case for the so-called Pamela satellite, or you would attach it to the space station as a platform. That's been done with the second beast here, which is the AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. For Pamela, this is a very small, it's about the same size than the Cree mission, like a 1 meter 20. This was actually, or still mounted, piggyback to a, a Russian spy satellite, which is much, much bigger in dimensions. 
and it's been just using this as a platform to get power and also to to uh, use a downlink to to transfer data and this detector basically has a special feature attached to it it has a permanent magnet has a magnet on it so this magnet produces a b field which uh, runs uh, perpendicular to the plane of uh, presentation here so that charged particles will be bent and the tracker inside the magnetic bore uh, traces then the particle uh, uh, tracks and allows to measure for example the curvature, ra curvature radius. This works up to roughly 100 GeV or so. Uh, be that basically tells you the tracker is very accurate. It's a silicon tracker so that's uh, allowing a good resolution of several 10 microns. Um, and then it has a, a calorimeter and also an additional neutron detector which which captures the neutrons uh, to make it possible to measure also hydronic energies better. And the uh, calorimeter is again a tungsten silicon type uh, sandwich uh, calorimeter. On top of it has, it has time of flight detections um, and it also has some anti-coincidence shield on the side so that it avoids particles going through the side, going through the tracker, which would be mistaken for maybe a particle with a small curvature radius. So this mission had a total mass of 400 kilograms and it flew for 10 years uh, until essentially not the detector was not working anymore, but that was the time that the Russian spy satellite uh, was uh, basically, uh, I think, put out of order. Um, another example here, quite similar, but on you know much larger scale. So this is a seven ton beast. It's got a, a size of uh, five by four by three meters. And that's the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer. So that consists out of a magnet and tracker layers in between. And then it has several uh, additional detectors on the top and on the bottom with an electromagnetic calorimeter in the, in the bottom, which measures the energy. So very similar setup, just very much bigger than the Pamela and also more complex because it has various different detector types. And the advantage of having so many detector types, just want to highlight here. So uh, in this case, for example, you know you've got um, a transition radiation detector, which is dependent, which is sensitive to the to the Lorentz factor of the particle. And then you can basically measure the signal, for example, for an electron, which is uh, producing transition radiation. And then you have the, the curvature here, then you measure Trenkov rings, and then you measure the shower, for example. And you can clearly separate various components. I don't want to go through all the details here, through either the curvature, the way that the Trenkov ring looks like, the signal in the calorimeter looks like, or the transition radiation detection looks like. So it's a quite a complex uh, and, and um, complementary information uh, for this detector. Um, let's say a little bit about the budget. This was a 1 billion euro uh, detector. And it's still flying, still running. Um, it started operation on the uh, International Space Station in 2011. And um, it's running now after a very big uh, con uh, repair work took place just last year, which required several um, EVAs of astronauts. And they had to fix the cooling system because the system has to be maintained at a very constant temperature. Because once you start having temperature deviations, specifically differentially across the detector, the tracker system will, for example, operate not so well anymore. So you lose the tracker information, and that's quite important uh, to achieve something they, they claim roughly 10 micrometer um, resolution of the tracker, time resolution of about 100 picoseconds, and uh, resolution on the beta of about uh, 10 to the minus 3. Now, as a final example for space-based mission, uh, which does not measure charged cosmic rays, but measures gamma rays. I just want to show you a little bit more about the so-called Fermilat mission. This is a mission which has been flying since 2008. And um, it's now also having, it has some competition now. There's another detector coming from the Chinese-Italian collaboration, which is called Dumpy, which is uh, operating since 2015. And there is a Russian satellite, which is uh, scheduled to fly uh, in the near future. But the operational principle is always the same for these detectors. Since we're talking about charged, uh, not charged, but photon detectors, uh, we need essentially just a tracker, which tracks the electrons and the electron that positron, and we need a calorimeter. So that's how this device looks like. And a very important component is to have an anti-coincidence shield. So the whole detector is basically covered by a scintillator detector that produces a strong signal when an, an electron or a proton, for example, passes through because we're not interested in those. So this acts as a veto. Only for a photon, which doesn't leave a strong signal or doesn't leave a signal in the, in the scintillator, 
This will enter the detector, make a pair production process, produce an electron and positron, this is tracked, and then through the tracking you basically determine which direction it comes from, because that's important and you want to measure that very accurately, because that's what you do, you want to measure gamma rays coming from sources, they are not deflected in magnetic fields. And then you have a calorimeter which measures the energy deposited by the electron and positron. So the Fermi uh, detector consists out of, for example, tracking units, which are uh, small towers. The whole thing has the dimension about a meter times a meter. And uh, there are 16 of these towers, so they're about 20-something centimeters um, size. And each of these towers of silicon trackers, so this is several layers of silicon trackers, interleaved with tungsten foils, which act as a converter material. Um, and the tracker consists out of strip detectors, which are uh, oriented with a 90 degree angle. And then uh, on the bottom, each of these towers has a calorimeter, which consists out of uh, sodium iodine crystals. And they are packed in such a way that also the, the position of the electron when it enters the calorimeter can be reconstructed. And then this, this system basically achieves an angular resolution actually of about 0.1 degrees and energy resolution of about 10%.